Shalom and Merry Christmas to each of you. Thank you so much for joining us for this special uh, teaching online called The Christmas Story. I know many of you are watching this live uh, via Zoom, and uh, you are really uh, a blessing to us. I know you're watching from really all over the world, and uh, also perhaps you're watching this on a recording. So either way, we are so thankful to God for you as you tune in and learn with us about the Christmas story in the context of the land of Israel. In fact, where we're heading to today are basically two places. We're heading, first of all, to Nazareth, which is right located here in the Lower Galilee. And then we're going to track Joseph and Mary's route all the way to a place called Bethlehem. And, of course, on the way, we'll talk about uh, cultural things and certainly the challenges of the travel, but we want to really focus on God's redemptive plan as it really unfolded here uh, in the first century in a very miraculous way, as you know. So we want to really focus on uh, Luke 1, the Annunciation, of course, Luke 2, the birth narrative, but other passages from the Old Testament that uh, become fulfilled by Jesus. Uh, the Isaiah passages, of course, Micah 5 and others as well. So we want to learn and appreciate the Christmas story in the context of where it actually took place. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll launch right into our teaching. Lord in heaven, thank you so much for your redemptive plan. Lord Jesus, you were sent just at the right time for the salvation of the world. And that includes our salvation. So we are so thankful that we can together join our hearts from different places really around the world and focus upon you. Thank you for the unfolding of your redemptive plan as mentioned in your word. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get started with our teaching now. So we begin this teaching by realizing that Christmas is all about God's redemptive plan becoming fulfilled by Yeshua Jesus as he was born in Bethlehem. This presentation will walk through a lot of biblical references. It will focus on a little history and a touch of archaeology. But I do want our primary focus to be on the wonderful salvation that God has provided now through Jesus, our Savior. Isaiah said this, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. The Apostle Paul would take the message of Jesus to the Gentile world, and he would write to the Galatian church. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. I just love this term, the fullness of time. When the fullness of time had come, or just at the right time, God sent his son. Personally speaking, that's my favorite phrase of any scripture passage uh, when it comes to the Christmas message. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, and Jesus would be born in a place called Bethlehem, in a very small country called Judea in the Roman Empire, just a small country, and yet... God provided redemption for the world here. When we take a, a bigger picture, if you will, of the entire ancient Near Eastern world, of course, we uh, realize how extensive the Roman world actually was. Of course, it included this area where Israel is located, uh, Turkey today and Greece and Italy where Rome was located. Uh, all of this was an area prime now for receiving the good news of God. Of course, uh, here in Israel, in Bethlehem specifically, is where God chose 
uh, to send his son. And yet this whole Roman world was ready. They were primed with a common language, Greek. They were prepared with roadways all over the Roman Empire, such as the roads that we can still see today in places like Greece and in Italy. The Via Ignatia and the Appian Way are still roads that we can see today. And yet in this entire Roman world, God sent his son to a little town called Bethlehem, born there of the Virgin Mary. So really the narrative begins in Nazareth. Uh, Today Nazareth sits on the ridge. In fact, this ridge begins the lower Galilee, the region of this lower Galilee. Uh, We're taking this drone uh, photo from the precipice of Nazareth, uh, traditionally located here. Of course, it's mentioned in Luke chapter 4. Today, the the town of Nazareth is about 80,000 or so, uh, primarily uh, Arab Israelis as well as a few uh, Jewish Israelis as well. Uh, But in the days of Jesus, the town didn't look like this. Uh, This church was built. It's a Catholic church called the Church of Annunciation. It's not a very old church. It only dates to the, the 20th century, I think 19, I'm thinking 1920s or 30s. Uh, and then rebuild a few times, I believe. Uh, But the church um, sits right on probably the area where ancient Nazareth was located. Now, Nazareth was so small that it wasn't even mentioned in some Jewish uh, resources. So my guess is it was large enough, of course, to have a synagogue, as we know from Luke 4, but it was a very modest, a very small uh, village, and maybe it looked like this. Uh, We're not sure. There is some archaeology here very close by to the church, by the way. Uh, and this, uh, some archaeologists would say this is a first century dwelling or house structure. We can't be sure, of course, if it was and if indeed it was, if Mary and Joseph uh, were, was, were familiar with uh, this structure itself. But the passage in Luke 1 is one that's worth reading once again. Because when we understand who Mary was, a very young girl, maybe as young as 13 or 14, uh, but yet uh, she was one who encountered the angel Gabriel. This is how it reads. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. It's remarkable what Mary says here. I am the Lord's servant. Now understand that she was already betrothed to Joseph. The betrothal process was an interesting one in the first century Jewish world. In fact, some of this is still practiced today. Uh, You can see some of the terms that I listed. The terms of the Shidukin was the determination of the Mohar or the purchase price or dowry. You see, the the 
family of the groom had to pay the the dad primarily had to pay the dad of the bride and of course the mohar was determined by the value of the bride to her father's family and mary was probably very young so probably a, a standard wage or price was set now if the price was agreeable a poured cup of wine was used to legally seal the ketubah, or the contract. Both the future groom and the bride had to drink of the cup to indicate their approval. Oh, I think this is quite interesting. The groom drank first. He was already consenting. And then he waited patiently for the bride. And if she agreed to the terms... She also drank from the cup. If she did not, well, that's the end of this potential engagement. The relationship was over. After purifying themselves separately in the ritual bath or the mikveh, a brief public ceremony followed. And under the chupa or the canopy, their pledge to one another was made public. So now they were officially betrothed. Uh, they did not live together, nor did they have sexual relations together. In fact, the, this was the time for the groom uh, during this betrothal period. In fact, uh, the Talmud says that this period uh, of the betrothal was at least uh, one year in length if the bride was a virgin. Less, of course, if she was an adult. In public, the bride wore a veil to inform other men that she was already claimed. So here's Mary. She's walking around every day with a veil over her, her face because she wanted to communicate that she was already pledged for. And yet Joseph was taking all this time, up to a year, as the oral law suggested, and he was uh, busy building a, an additional house or room uh, to his father's house, and uh, while this was being made or built, uh, the preparations for the wedding <clears throat> were arranged. So this is where Mary is. And during the course of some point in this betrothal period, this is when Gabriel, the angel, visits her. A remarkable cultural encounter. Now, historically, we have to say that this guy here, pictured, his name is... Quirinius, he's mentioned in Luke 2. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus mentions him actually as the governor of Syria. He was appointed by uh, Caesar uh, and given the task of assessing property there and in Judea, which is interesting. So we have an historical person mentioned in Luke 2 during the time of the census. Well, uh, there may be a little question here in terms of the timing of this census. Josephus asserts an explicit date for the census being in 6 AD, in the 37th year of Caesar's defeat of Antony at Actium in 31 BC. My question is, was Josephus correct with this date? I will say yes and no, because there were actually two census, most likely the one in 6 AD, but one prior to this as well because records indicate that Quirinius was no minor figure in Roman politics. Thus, he was already governing as early as 12 BC. So could it be that Quirinius was uh, performing or uh, requiring a census as early as 5 BC? And of course, because of Herod's death eventually in 4 BC, the census was not completed until 3 or 2 BC. And as mentioned before, certainly a second census took place. And we know that because uh, one of Herod's son, Archelaus, was actually banished. And a revolt takes place, a Jewish revolt against the Romans in 6 AD. So a second census was required. My main point is that this guy, as this inscription actually indicates his name, was really a historical figure, and we have no reason to doubt the historicity of the text of Luke 2. So the route that Mary and Joseph took was this. They left the Lower Galilee, walked through the Jezreel Valley, out by Beit Shan, down 
uh, to the Jordan Valley and Jericho specifically. So they're heading south down this valley and then eventually heading west and a little south, ascending over 4,000 feet in elevation to Bethlehem. This is another uh, topography map, compliments and credit to the Satellite Bible Atlas. So they leave Nazareth. They enter the Jezreel Valley. They head east to the area of Beit Shan. They head south door, down the Jordan Valley to Jericho. And then they head west and a little south to Bethlehem. Imagine being a young woman, pregnant, and now traveling about 75 or 80 miles to give birth in Bethlehem. So Mary and Joseph leave the, the Jezreel Valley. They head southward in this northern part of the Jordan Valley. They come straight down south to the area of Jericho. They pass by the Old Testament site of Jericho to this location here. By the way, this was the area where Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus uh, lived as well. They are two uh, people, men, mentioned in the gospel text. But from here, the adventure or the climb began because from Jericho, uh, the location, by the way, of Herod the Great's Winter Palace, uh, they traveled up this area through what is called the Wadi Kelt, up past Cyprus, a Hasmonean palace, up the ascent of Edomim, and eventually to Jerusalem and as far as Bethlehem, five miles south. So this is the route they took from the area of New Testament Jericho all the way up, up, up. In fact, today, this is this uh, very, uh, it's not even open now. It's just uh, a very uh, dirty uh, dirt road, I should say. Uh, not well-kept road, I guess, is the better way to describe it. Although today in our tour, sometimes we do some hiking actually down in the canyon. But this, uh, uh, this uh, road that's not well maintained is uh, probably the route that Mary and Joseph took. Now, credit to the Bible places and Todd Bolin, uh, who uh, directs this ministry. Uh, most likely, Joseph and Mary even uh, went up part of the Roman road or the section of the Roman road that went through the heart of this Judean desert. So this is what they encountered as they continued to climb and ascend up through the desert on their way to Bethlehem. Now we do know where Bethlehem is, of course. The modern city that we'll see in a short moment is quite uh, large today. But even in the second century, early on by uh, someone named Justin Martyr, he actually wrote, and hear what part of earth he was to be born in as another prophet, Micah, foretold. Now, there is a village in the land of the Jews, 35 stadia. One stadia was about close to 600 feet or two football fields long, specifically 185 meters, from Jerusalem, in which Jesus Christ was born, as you can ascertain also from the registers of the taxing made by Serenius, that was the Greek name of Quirinius, you are first procurator in Judea. So Justin Martyr affirms the location of Bethlehem. Today it's a, a very large Palestinian city, right on the edge of the Judean desert. But right in the heart of this city today is this church called the Church of Nativity. It's one of three of the earliest churches uh, built in about 325 A.D., I love this picture, by the way, because as you can see, once in a while, every few seasons, uh, Bethlehem and Jerusalem, they get a, a touch of snow. So inside of this church that was uh, built in the 4th century, rebuilt many times through the 5th and 6th century, uh, even the Crusaders uh, later on. Uh, so inside this church is the beautiful sanctuary, uh, the pillars and some of the uh, the, the mosaics, the wall reliefs, if you will. In fact, the floor of this uh, old church, the 4th century church, is well below uh, the modern floor today. You can see the front of the church 
And then right below the front of the church is the traditional location of Jesus' birth. Now, we're mentioning this because, of course, it looks more like a fireplace <laughs> for us today. But uh, traditionally, this was once a cave where humbly Mary and Joseph went. And, of course, we'll talk about the location of the birth. But today, this is uh, a highlight for many Orthodox people to come here and honor the birth of Jesus. Now, certainly caves were uh, all around in this area. In fact, Jerome uh, had his own cave. He was here in Bethlehem. In fact, he was the one who translated the Hebrew scriptures uh, into the Latin Vulgate. So we do know that St. Jerome had a presence here in Bethlehem as well. But probably the postcard picture of Bethlehem, maybe this preserves uh, maybe the size of Bethlehem in the days of Jesus. My guess is a, a bit larger than this, but yet uh, this is the context in which, in which uh, Jesus was born, as prophesied by Micah, who said this, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Isaiah says this, contemporary prophet with Micah, by the way, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. And Jeremiah, about a hundred years after Isaiah, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. And then those familiar words from Isaiah 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So perhaps this best portrays Mary and Joseph coming into this small town called Bethlehem, the house of bread. And as we read from Luke 2, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged or betrothed to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Let's focus upon these two words, cloth and manger. Question is, is there any significance about the type of cloth that Mary used for Jesus? Well, you see here this Greek word that actually is in the form of a verb and not a noun. It implied a wrapping or a bundling of a child. Now, culturally, this wrapping was done with long strips of cloth, not necessarily a sign of poverty, but a customary sign of the personal care of a loving mother. Now, of course, there are some who like to uh, connect with the swaddling clothes as a foreshadowing of what would eventually be at Jesus' death, the shrouding of Jesus' body in preparation for the tomb. But just know that this word for this type of shrouding cloth is not used here. So I don't think that this tradition is warranted here in this case. But in terms of the location, the text does not say that there was not a room available, but, but uh, no space 
topos in the inn. This means that uh, no doubt Mary and Joseph were looking for simply space. Now, the Greek word translated in is also an interesting one. Kataluma is the term. Kataluma. And it's only used once in or another one other time in the Gospels in uh, the case of the upper room. If you remember prior to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus spends time in the upper room, probably the Passover meal, in the Kataluma. Now, the word described an upper chamber of a house or a guest room. So, could it be that the guest room was typically where people lived in the night, uh, the residence of the people or the families on the second floor of a common stone house? The ground floor was reserved for cooking, uh, the ovens were here, and of course, the animals also were able to seek, uh, seek shelter here uh, as well. So maybe this is a better picture of the upper room or the guest room. There was no space for Mary and Joseph, so they simply had to be content with an area down here among the animals. If you've ever traveled with us, you've known uh, this uh, the site and this experience at Katsreen. It's a stone house that's been reconstructed, and uh, it really gives you a sense of what houses look like uh, back in the days of Jesus, even though this dates a few centuries later. This is the courtyard of the area, and perhaps this uh, helps us uh, picture or imagine uh, Mary and Joseph at least finding shelter in the courtyard of the house. And of course, after Jesus was born, he was placed in a manger. No doubt, a stone feeding trough that was common back in those days. Archaeologically, hundreds of these have been found. This, I think, portrays a very accurate picture of the humility of the birth of Jesus. So the shepherds in the fields. The traditional shepherd's fields is a, in a place called Beit Sechor, which is just to the east of Bethlehem. This is a chapel that we'll visit in just a, a short minute. Uh, but you can see that this area still has some uh, vacant fields. And of course, again, a, just a traditional location for where the shepherds were out with their flocks at night. This church is called the Church of the Shepherds. It was built in the 1930s or early 40s, designed by an Italian architect. It's a beautiful chapel, beautiful to sing here. The acoustics, the echo are, is uh, really spectacular. And of course, the three reliefs on the walls are really uh, traditional as well. Here are the shepherds as they encounter the angelic beings. Of course, we read this in Luke 2. And there were shepherds living out in their flocks, nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. 
which were just as they had been told. So who were the heavenly hosts? Pictured here in the typical traditional way, perhaps Hebrews chapter 12 indicates that they were celestial beings referred to as the innumerable angels. Just imagine the glorious yet fearful sound and the sight of them. These shepherds certainly were overwhelmed and astonished. We really can't even imagine or picture what this experience would have been. I take note of this particular modern piece of art. Who knows? Maybe the experience was something captured like, like captured in this picture. But of course, the second question uh, for us, and a very important one, is, well, who were these shepherds? Well, we do have a hint in the passage of Luke 2 that they were the shepherds who were allowed to be out in the fields at night. Where were they? In a place probably called Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock. In fact, this is mentioned in Micah chapter 4. Here is that passage. I will make the lame my remnant, those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem out in the fields at night. So perhaps the shepherds were these unique shepherds given a very special responsibility. 19th century Alfred Edersheim says, said this, This Migdal Eder was not the watchtower for the ordinary flocks which pastured on the barren sheep grounds beyond Bethlehem, but lay close to the town on the road to Jerusalem. A passage in the Mishnah leads to the conclusion that the flocks which pastured there were destined for temple sacrifices, and accordingly that the shepherds who watched over them were not ordinary shepherds. The same Mishnaic passage also leads us to infer that these flocks lay out all the year round, since they were spoken of as in the fields thirty days before Passover that is, in the month of February, when in Palestine or Israel the average rainfall is nearly greatest. Perhaps Alfred Edersheim really was correct, and I believe he was, in helping us understand that these shepherds were the Passover shepherds who were the first to behold the Passover Lamb of God. Jesus, the Passover Lamb of God, who would eventually give his life for each of us. So I want to end this time with talking about this old ancient hymn. It was written by someone in the 4th into 5th century translated into English in 1850. There are nine verses actually to this poem, and this poem is actually put to a chant-like melody, uh, most likely in the 12th century. So it sounds old, and yet the words are rich, all nine verses of this poem, and yet I want us to simply pause and listen to four of them, as shared by a gentleman named Michael Lining. I believe this is a beautiful, one of the most beautiful renditions of this ancient Christmas hymn called Of the Father's Love Begotten. Let's hear this as we as we absorb the beauty of the words and the richness of the message of salvation.
In just at the right time, God sent his son, born humbly in Bethlehem. For unto us a son is given. Merry Christmas.